So we are in live now. Thank you. Debasu, uh, I think yes, we can allow we can allow a couple of minutes for people to sign in. We have sixty participants. 60. We have sixty. Yes, yes. Maybe we wait for one more minute. Thank you. You tell us. Yeah, I think uh, people are signing in. Hi, Manu. Hi, good morning. You made life very difficult to talk about safeguards in 10 minutes. <laughs> Justin, good morning to you. <laughs> okay. But you have to apologize. I mean, I have to apologize to you. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot really uh, be elastic about our time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think we should start now. Um, good morning, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to all of you to the African Development Bank's fully virtual evaluation week 2020. And to this first session on IDEV Operations Clinic. My name is Madhu and I manage the division two of the independent evaluation function of the bank, dealing with 
agriculture, human and social development, governance and country, and corporate evaluations. As you are aware, the theme for the 2020 evaluation week is from learning to transformational change in Africa, accelerating Africa's delivery of sustainable development goals in the decade of action. The IDEV Operations Clinic brings together a series of presentations by different bank departments on their role in advancing the quality at entry of operations and the assistance provided to the task managers. We have put together six presentations in three groups of two presentations each. After presentations by each group, we will have a Q&A session to be enriched by your active participation. Now, let me give you some essential housekeeping information. Firstly, please be aware that all microphones are muted by default and the participants cannot unmute it themselves. I am authorized to mute or unmute those participants to whom I give the floor. Secondly, please note that French and English interpretations are available. So if you are given the floor, you can speak in either of the two languages. To listen to the interpretation, click on the small world icon on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen and select the language of your choice. Thirdly, to ask a question or to make a comment, please use the Zoom's Q&A feature on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And finally, please raise your hand if you wish to make a live intervention. I'll try to let you in depending on the time available. Thank you. Now, allow me to briefly introduce to you our distinguished panel of presenters in order of their appearance in this session. They are Mr. Debasu Yanchio. Debasu is Principal Evaluation Officer at IDEF. Debasu is also the founder member and uh, former president of the Cameroon Development Evaluation Association and board member of the International Development Evaluation Association, IDEA. He will present the challenges regarding quality at entry of the bank's operations and tasks and expectations of task managers. Debasu, welcome. Mr. Richard Shear. Richard is uh, Chief Quality Assurance Officer with the bank's OPSCOM Secretariat and Quality Assurance Department. Richard leads the team for results measurement system and quality management and coordinates the bank's operations academy. He will present to us the support for results and quality assurance of operations. Richard, welcome. Mr. Armand Enzaimana. Armand is a division manager in the delivery performance management and results department. Armand's specialization include financial controls, organizational effectiveness, and performance management in Africa and the Caribbean. In this session, Armo will present to us the lessons learned on project startup delays, jointly with Mr. Sabri Ben Mafta. Armo, welcome. Mr. Sabri Ben, ben Mafta is Senior Performance Monitoring Officer at the bank's Delivery and Implementation Support Division. Sabri's specializations include monitoring portfolio performance, IT solutions and uh, operational performance. As I said, um, Sabri will present jointly with Armo the lessons learned on project startup delays. Sabri, welcome. Mr. Patrick Mabusa. Patrick is a principal research economist in the macroeconomic policy forecasting and research department. Patrick's specialization includes additionality and development outcomes public-private partnerships, economic regulation, infrastructure financing, and energy markets. Patrick will speak to us on the bank's ADOVA network, ADOVA framework, and tools. Patrick, welcome. 
Mr. Justin Eckert. Justin is a lead environmental safeguard specialist with the bank's safeguards and compliance department, SNSC. Justin, together with SNSC team, is responsible for ensuring compliance of the bank's operations to the requirements of integrated safeguard system. Justin will present the bank's framework for environmental and social safeguards. Justin, welcome to you. And finally, Ms. Lynette Meriti. Lynette is a principal gender specialist and the, at the bank's uh, Southern Africa regional office in Pretoria. Lynette is a strong advocate of institutional transformation and responsive programming that promote equality for women, men, girls, and boys. Lynette will speak to us today on the bank's gender framework. Lynette, welcome. Colleagues, these are our presenters. Now, without any further delay, let us start the presentations. First, I have the pleasure to invite Mr. Debasu Yantio to present the challenges in quality of entry of the bank's operations and the task manager's expectations. Debasu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello. Hello, Debasu, you can start uh, now. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yes, we see your screen. Okay, thank you very much for uh, coming to listen to me. Um, I'm presenting um, the results of a survey that we carry out in, uh, in July and August. Uh, among the bank task manager and investment officers to understand what are their challenges in terms of uh, quality at entry, the moment they are designing their operations uh, and uh, what type of support they are expecting from, from the bank. <clears throat> so this presentation, during this presentation, uh, we identify the main constraints and challenges to this task manager during the presentation and identify areas where we can provide uh, some support and how we are going to tailor the, the support that we are going to provide during these three days, uh, during the advisory uh, that we are carrying out as part of this uh, operation clinic. So the profile of the participant to our service uh, we, we targeted uh, 80 task managers and investment op officers who currently have uh, uh, operation into design. So we had a response rate of uh, 39%. That means uh, among all the 80, the, the response that we had, uh, we had 39%, but we have to say the true response rate was uh, 56 because uh, uh, some of the, the group that we targeted was not present. They were on leave. So uh, they, they, couldn't, uh, they couldn't respond to our survey. The, the respondents work, 65% uh, of the, the respondents work on, in the public sector. 52% uh, of the respondents are located uh, in the headquarters of the bank, and about 20% in the regions, offices, and 29% in the country. Uh, most of them work on, not most, 17% 17, 17 work in the finance sector, uh, 15 in <clears throat> the agri sector. 33% uh, of the respondents completed the operation academy. And 80% of them had a prior training in project management. Uh, as you can see, uh, the respondents are very experienced 
people. Uh, 66 percent have uh, uh, have designed more than five operations, and 17 percent are young to the role of uh, task manager. And 60 percent of these uh, respondents never receive any support from uh, BDEF. What is the current state of uh, <clears throat> the gaps. Most of the gaps that uh, comes out from the survey is inadequate resource-based log frame. So they have issue putting it in the right way. And also uh, aspect related to risk identification and management. How do you frame the, the risk and how uh, do you uh, make it clear? And how do you discuss the plausibility of this risk and how the risk affect the performance of the project. So some area came uh, that they have less problem, like uh, how the implementation preparedness, the clarity of the, the presentation of the problem and the mainstreaming of cross-cutting issues, gender, climate finance, and youth employment. The major constraints we have major constraint we have uh, the workload is too much, irrealistic deadline, uh, the templates that are not really complete and does not give a, a comprehensive guideline to task manager. There are too many directives to follow and an inadequate knowledge of the result based management and inappropriate work condition, particularly the difficulty to, to, to access uh, uh, sector uh, expertise. BDEF carried out uh, an, an evaluation in 2018. And what we found is that uh, the gaps that this survey uh, has revealed were confirmed. So they, they were same uh, issue around evaluability, risk identification, the time constraint to design the project. So we were not, uh, the implementation readiness was not confirmed because uh, the 2018 evaluation showed that it was a, an issue. And this survey shows it is no more an issue. Maybe it, the situation has changed. So area of support and type of support that is needed uh, we have uh, evaluability, the training, the, the support that is needed is training more. In terms of implementation readiness, uh, the most um, valuable support is to provide advice on the fly. That's during to have a chat with the, the task manager. Uh, it is the same for mainstreaming cross-cutting issue. And training is uh, the most valuable one uh, support uh, in terms of economic and financial analysis. And to account for selectivity factors, advice is the most, is the preferred type of support that is needed. Uh, let me mention that according to the, 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 the guideline of the bank relating to selectivity that was adopted in February, 2018, the selectivity covers uh, four broad areas. How you focus on the strategic priority of the bank, uh, the relative size of the operation, we favor larger, relatively large operation, the, how you mainstream gender, climate, and uh, infrastructure in your operation. So those are the type of areas and type of training uh, support that task manager are, are willing to get. And uh, about the demand of uh, IDEF services, 59% uh, have read uh, IDEF evaluation. 75% uh, they read when there is, uh, when uh, IDEF release, a, when they are informed that IDEF are release a, a product. And 96% never requested IDEF advice, which is normal because we are, we are not supposed to provide advice directly to, uh, to staff. 
So 69% have attended EDEP event, which is something that has a value for us. So we are going to provide during these three days advice to the tax manager among the, the 80 who express interest in learning um, from what we do. So we are going to provide them access in the three step. Well, the PCN that they submitted, we are going to score the, the result based log frame that they submitted. We are going to calculate the selectivity index and the quality at entry, uh, at entry improvement plan uh, we are going to share with them. Uh, based on that uh, result, we are going to have a one hour Zoom session for each task manager. And we are going to uh, agree on a way to work on the quality at entry improvement plan. So that's how uh, uh, we are going to work this, uh, this during these three days in terms of um, advice in this operation claim. Thank you, Madhu. Over to you, Madhu. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Debasu. Thank you for this excellent presentation. Uh, it is uh, noted that some of, the, some of the critical factors we identified in our quality at entry evaluation as constraints or critical factors are not anymore the critical factors. Um, and also noted some of the critical new critical areas, which are the challenges for the bank's quality at entry. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Richard Shear to present the support for results and quality assurance of operations. Richard, the floor okay, is yours. Thank you very much, but uh, could you please close your uh, uh, sharing because I cannot share my PowerPoint when uh, um, Debadu too is, is, is sharing his screen. Okay, now I think I can, okay. So um, I think um, I'm, this is a very short presentation. Um, I actually, you know, I always believe we should try to have these uh, sessions as interactive as possible. So I actually had two icebreak questions. Um, if it's okay, uh, Madhu, Madhu um, uh, I think they're already prepared and beforehand. Maybe we can share it and then we can see the results of the polls. And I think this is a, a nice way to, to keep this, make the session interactive. Madhu, you're on, on mute, huh? Richard, uh, yeah. uh, thank you. Uh, let, let us give it a try. Yeah. Okay, so 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 I think your team. Uh, so uh, could your team or your IT team share the two questions? One question is basically on if you're satisfied with the support that you get in terms of project design, and second one rated from one to five, and the second one is uh, what are your main challenges? Those are the basically the two icebreak questions. But. Uh, But I'm how not so to, How do you want to go about it? Uh, I thought it was already in the system, but okay, apparently the something is not uh, ideal. So let me just start the presentation then. So how can I say it? Um, uh, so, so yeah, so support um, for results in quality of operations. Uh, I think this is, this is a very short presentation. It only has a few slides. Um, it fits very much to the previous presentation. Um, which focuses on, on some of the weaknesses from the surveys, including the results-based framework, including the risk analysis, and including the operations academy. So when we talk about support, I think we should also think about in, that we're in 2020. And when we're in 2020, um, yes, we used to have clinics, but I think now in a decentralized setting, um, thinking about e-learning opportunities, um, both for existing staff and for new staff, is, is really um, a branch of the future or an element of the future. So my first um, uh, first few slides will be two or three slides will be on Operations Academy, which gives a very broad framework of support um, that the quality assurance team gives. The second part will be on the readiness review, which is uh, the new systematic way that we are planning to provide support to enhance quality results focused of operations, including results-based framework. And the third part will be on one or two slides on the results-based framework, what we are planning to, 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 to change 
um, based on our COVID-19 experience um, and what uh, Tony Blair said uh, one or two weeks ago. Um, basically, if you have, um, um, you should look at the crisis, see what kind of crisis in the crisis mode you did and see what you can generalize. And I think the new RB left fits that philosophy. So that's very broadly speaking what I'm planning to present in the next, I would say eight to 10 minutes. So I'm first uh, uh, two, three slides. We now have about uh, 450, 500 people doing the operations academy. Um, it fits with the, the broad knowledge of the bank of, of uh, strengthening the, the, the knowledge of the bank. When, the way we, we approach this question is when you're recruited in the bank, we assume you have a certain amount of competencies and skills. And what you might be more challenged with is how the institution itself does it. And it's that element which, um, um, which the Operations Academy is trying to uh, fill. So we have a gateway course, which were the first set of 10 courses. And then it's around uh, uh, three or four job families, including the task manager pathway, which is a sovereign operations, the investment, op uh, investment officers, which is a non-sovereign operations pathway and the CPO pathway. And then we have a, a country manager pathway. And the idea here is really to have um, um, courses uh, around the job families. Um, the gateway course was already launched at the end of last year. And um, um, somewhere next year, we are going to launch two other pathways. So we're making progress um, together with um, everybody that's designing it. The various courses is a bank-wide initiative. Um, and also it's, it's with everybody, the strong leadership of RDVP with around 500 people already, 450 to 500 people already finished the gateway course. So the gateway course um, is already online. We would encourage everybody to do it. I myself was in the bank already like 10 years. Um, and um, quite frankly, I learned a lot. So people, even when people say that uh, you're in the bank, you know the system, you'll be surprised how much, uh, how much you can learn for, ranging from uh, the, the climate change classifications to the due diligence, uh, various due diligence and anti-corruption tools. Um, so, I mean, I would really encourage everybody, even if you're longer in the bank to, um, to do these 10 courses, at least the gateway that would, would also be uh, an element for the next, uh, for the next, next uh, pathways. It was also said that um, already several times that uh, the president once is very strongly in favor of this and is, and, and is most likely going to become mandatory for all staff um, at one point. So some of the results, and this is my last slide. Um, you know, we, the, the bank sometimes have a, has a culture of launching things and may, has sometimes some challenging of, uh, of, of delivering. So we delivered the gateway courses and these, these are the surveys what, um, what came out. And what you see is that 98% um, of all the participants actually found it very useful um, uh, to uh, to do these courses, um, and this is like a, this is about an end of 450 to 460 people. Um, then, if you look at the people, the composition of people that is indeed a lot of people that were seven years or three years um, in the bank. Um, that those are most compositions. But the most interesting part, what we found, is actually the people that the gateway courses were actually also people that wanted to go into operations. So they are not only the, although the, when we first designed this initiative, it was actually meant for uh, operations people. Um, what we see is that a lot of people are actually interested in moving into operations. And it's also a tool to, um, to, uh, um, uh, to, for, for, to, for, to help job mobility, to give the basics of, the, of, of operations to the staff. So that is um, the three slides on Operations Academy, which is a systematic way of providing support and quality operation in a very broad field, um, topics ranging from policies and strategies to anti-corruption to, to safeguards and uh, safeguards issues. Um, now on the readiness review, um, like I said, um, uh, providing support on a systematic basis. Um, it's about also risk analysis. It's about re results, um, results readiness. So how can I say it? Um, this is the structure of the new results framework or new readiness review. Um, the results, uh, new results framework is in the second dimension. Um, we're now, it has already been endorsed by Oxfam. We're currently piloting it. We're piloting it both in the context of Wakanda and we're piloting it 
in the current process in terms of country teams. Um, I think there are two or three main issues. Um, I think you know there are uh, some new areas where we focus on including positive effects, which borders additionality. It came, the idea came from Inter-American Development Bank. Um, other elements are more for, were more um, uh, were more shown as part of what was um, certain areas of, of our management that we wanted to strengthen, including results frameworks and policy compliance. Um, so I think um, um, uh, the strong role of policy compliance, including country allocations, is, is also uh, very important. And what is very important also is that there's a very big team behind it. We're the coordinators, and there's a very team behind it across the bank that helps us, including from the cross-cutting priorities of gender, fragile states, um, and climate change, all the way up to, of course, the SNFIs for procurement and financial management. So the main changes, this is the last slide again for a readiness review. I think without going into too much details, I think there's a, um, a big discussion going how we should strengthen the readiness review to, as a quality tool. Um, obviously quality is not only the re results framework, it's also the teams and how they work together and how they get support. Um, so, um, um, but the main issue is basically we strengthened the role of independent um, uh, independent review on the quality process. Um, it's now very strongly coordinated by us. Um, we don't do any more average ratings. As every statistician can tell you, once you average something, you lose information. So we now provide disaggregated ratings and performance uh, measurement, and we have a verification function. So we look at... Um, at country team, what comes in country team at par, and then we look at what is um, what goes to OPSCOM. And I think in that sense, it comes very close to what ADOA is doing. Um, so I think this is just a sheet of how you would see it. Like I said, you have the, the strategic readiness uh, dimension, which is really about, um, we assume it's always um, compliant. So it's really yes and no, binary. And then results and implementation readiness are rated from one to four. And it, and, and it shows the weaknesses straight away. Um, it doesn't show any more averages. Um, so I think that is what we're looking at in terms of readiness review in, uh, and also providing, this also comes if there's a challenge that uh, we will also provide individual and tailor-made support if necessary, but more in a systematic way. It's not like what we did two years ago with the operations clinics with, when people can walk in um, and this is very systematic. Obviously, if people want to have certain support, we'll get there. So then the next two slides is basically on the results framework. Um, so this is basically also the second dimension when we saw the results readiness review. Um, I put this slide in because um, the survey came up in a previous in a previous presentation about two things, risk analysis and the results framework. And here, um, um, uh, the things that we, we are changing is, um, putting a theory of change, putting in a monitoring plan, which is an m and &E plan, which is also done by some of the other MDBs, a risk, a risk analysis matrix, uh, and a results framework. And this is the core objective, what we piloted also in the, at least the results framework part, we piloted in the COVID one, and it, it was very, um, and we provided direct support to teams, which was very much appreciated. And we look forward to continuing um, that kind of modality. So I think this is the I think the last slide I have. Um, this is how the what we're currently looking at in terms of the new uh, results framework. Um, so um, it really looks more like a performance matrix in the sense it's a measurement and clear outcome and output indicators. Um, performance indicators are more as an alignment function, so you would not see it anymore as a sorry impact indicators are more of an alignment function. Um, and you would uh, see, you won't necessarily be, there won't be any, when you go to the border, people ask always impact, impact, impact. Um, it's at a very high level and the function is that it's supposed to be an alignment function and not a performance indicator. And I think that would also help in clarifying it, uh, clarifying the results frameworks and create. So we also simplify it for task managers um, um, uh, to help uh, to help address some of the points that the surveys came out. Um, so I think that is what I had in mind. I think I, I tried to be focused, Mali, 
um, so that we have a lot of time for, for questions and answers, which is the most interesting part of, um, of, of these kind of sessions. Um, Madi, can I give you the floor? Or do you want to, do you want us to highlight something or further highlight? No, I am fine. Um, I think let us invite uh, uh, participation uh, from, uh, from colleagues. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this excellent presentation, very insightful presentation. Um, I would now like to uh, open the floor for discussion, the Q&A. Uh, before that, um, before I do that, let me remind you of the of a few things. Uh, first, please note that you are you can use a Zoom Q&A feature on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions. Uh, second, please make your questions very brief uh, to the point. And. Uh, and third, it is likely that we may not have enough time to answer all the questions raised, apologies in advance. Answers uh, to such unanswered questions will be taken up online subsequently. Now, okay, I am checking uh, for the questions. We have received uh, a couple of questions already. So the first question is from, uh, Okay, of course, that is in French uh, from uh, Mr. Mamadou Koulibaly. Uh, he says, Bonjour. Parler de renforcement de capacité, est-il possible de voir de la présentation? And then Madou? there's a question. Hello? Madou, do you want me to provide the answer? Yes, if you can translate it and give, be very helpful. Yeah, he was asking he if uh, the presentation will be available for participants. Okay, okay, great. So I'm sure the answer is affirmative. Uh, it will be available. And uh, there is a question for uh, Richard. Uh, that is from um, Frank Donald. I cannot hear you. Okay, is it okay now? Is it better? Hello? Yes, yes sorry, sorry. we can hear you. Huh? We can hear you. We are not here, okay. interpreters. So a, give me one second. A, okay, the question is from um, uh, Frank Donald Jobo to Richard. Richard, could you share the access links to the different courses? Thank you. So these are the two questions we have got so far. So colleagues, uh, please, uh, I welcome uh, your questions. Yes, just to reply very quickly, huh? it's a, basically there's an icon, there's an icon in our internet, you can click on it, it's called a, a quality assurance platform, go on it, click on it, and then you have Operations Academy and it's, it's there. If you have any more questions, um, please feel free to contact me with a quality matters email, um, but it's, it's very straightforward, just go, go, go to the icon of, uh, on the internet. Richard, uh, maybe the question is not from uh, people, IDEV staff. I don't think Frank Ronald Ajo is from the bank, so. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. okay. So yeah, no, that's, that, that's a good point. So um, the Operations Academy is indeed uh, um, focused on operations for the bank. For the moment, it's, um, uh, it, it's only for bank staff and we're thinking about making it broader for PIUs. We understand the more fundamental problem is that a lot of operations are actually not implemented by the bank. We are more of a supervision role. Um, we do provide um, tailor-made, including yesterday, uh, tailor-made uh, support to PIUs in two countries around a range of topics, not only on quality assurance and results management, but also on procurement, on financial management, everything related to um, management of the PIUs. Um, and um, uh, that is that is a focus of our training. So in all fairness, I think the the best would be to contact me bilaterally and then we see what we can do and to, together with ECAT um, because they're the ones managing the external part of um, uh, the, the trainings and, and making it online. But for the moment, the Operations Academy is for, for operations staff of the bank. Okay, thank you, Richard. There is another question from um, Dosa. Uh, 
she said, um, the question is, I would like to know more about the concept of alignment indicators. We explain. Ah, that's you. How you want to do it, Madi? You want to do it one by one, or do you want to collect a few questions? The questions are coming one by one. Um, okay. Okay. So, so either, we wait for, either we wait for some time sure. and uh, answer no, all of them, but I think it is better that we answer straight away in the interest okay. of time. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mari. So just to go back, I think, thank you for that interesting question. Alignment indicators, the, the core objective of alignment indicators is uh, um, to ensure it's um, from evaluation perspective that it's relevant. It's relevant for the country, it's relevant for the bank, it's relevant for the beneficiaries. So the key, uh, key, key concept of alignment is that it's, um, it's useful. Um, so you can make, uh, you can create a project. Um, I'll take an example. I would not say the name. An, an example of, of creating, uh, how can I say, the place where um, uh, we want to create a project which, uh, which creates uh, um, good sanitary um, facilities, but um, then you build a, literally a yacht area next to it. And then obviously you can have other outputs and outcomes that you like, but it's not relevant for that specific project area. Um, so, you know, that's the core concept of, of, of alignment. Um, and that's why we have indicators to ensure that it's aligned with either the actual national plan at the sector level or with the bank or most importantly with the beneficiaries. Um, so that's why we say it's not really a performance indicator. It's something which very often you see five or six years after the project is closed. So it's very much it's very much interested from evaluation point of view. It's not so much interested, Mari, from a point of view um, operations perspective per se, um, except from the design perspective to ensure that it's relevant before you actually fund the project. Okay, Richard, there is another question for you. Um, how do we benefit from the experience of the bank in monitoring, evaluate, evaluation, and planning? Uh, Atom, so this is, could you please uh, re, you reformulate the question or repeat the question, please? My apologies. How do we, uh, okay, how do we benefit from the experience of the bank in monitoring, evaluation, and planning? Okay, so, um, it's true, institutions like the bank, uh, we should do more to focus on sharing our, our knowledge with, um, with, with, uh, with, our, with our partners. And it can be partners of other MDBs like PTA or SADEC, other uh, partners, MDB partners in, in the region. It can be partners like the um, West African Bank in, in Togo. Um, it can be partners at national level. It can be evaluation, evaluation societies in Africa. Um, and the way we EDAP does it, of course, and Madi, I think you can also say a few words. Um, they have a very strong outreach uh, program, including with Parliament on uh, on strengthening um, the role of evaluations and ME. From our side, the way we um, we do have a program, but we are really focused on PIUs um, and um, ECATS, which is our knowledge management institution, is very much focused on outreach of strengthening uh, knowledge in Africa about key areas, including m and &Es. um, and EDA, and EDIP itself is very strongly engaged in sharing knowledge uh, of m and &E processes um, across Africa. Um, but Mali, maybe you can also say a few words, or um, um, Debazu can also say a few words on what EDIP is doing in terms of sharing its m and &E and evaluation knowledge with Africa. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, uh, you want to take the floor? Uh, thank you, Madhu. I, I think um, what BDEV is doing uh, in terms of uh, supporting eval evaluation capacity, we have less focus on monitoring, but more on evaluation. We provide support. Uh, thank you. We provide support, uh, BDEV provides support uh, through uh, its assistance to African Evaluation Association, AFRIA, um, the activity that they carry out to support a voluntary organization of professional evaluator across the member countries. We provide support through AFRIA, um, National Association 
who pass through Afria receive our support. Uh, also, during our evaluation in countries, in the regional countries, uh, at times we organize a knowledge sharing uh, session um, in some countries. So we interact with local evaluator to discuss uh, what we are doing and uh, it's a way of uh, learning. We also have support. We also have support uh, through um, other channel, but that's not really directed to individual directly. But it is to uh, development, uh, develop, development banks, regional development banks. So we also support uh, uh, parliamentarian through the Upnote network. That is. Uh, African Parliamentary Network on Development Evaluation. So we provide support to parliamentarians through that channel, uh, like we did in, in Cote d'Ivoire uh, last two weeks. So we had uh, parliamentarians and national stakeholders gathered together, and we had to discuss uh, around issue of evaluation. So I think, um, we also uh, share our publication. So on our website, all our evaluation and knowledge projects are free to download. We, we maintain some printed copies, but not that much. So all our knowledge is available on the website. So let me stop there. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Madu, Joseph, please. I was going to come to you. Uh, could you check in the yeah. Q and A? There yes. are some French uh, questions. Yeah. Could you please uh, deal with them? Yeah. Uh, uh, la question pour Debazou. Uh, comment la banque met-elle en œuvre sa politique d'évaluation d'impact des projets? Debazou. Oui, merci beaucoup. Voilà. Euh, ce que Bidev fait, la banque a une politique d'évaluation indépendante et dans le cadre de cette politique, à la demande des, des différentes parties prenantes, notamment euh, le conseil d'administration de la banque, nous, nous élaborons un programme de travail triennal. Un programme de travail triennal. Et il faut insister encore nous travaillons à la demande. Donc, euh, c'est vrai, mais ce n'est pas souvent le cas. Nous travaillons à la demande des différents parties prenantes. Et toutes ces demandes, en termes d'évaluation, sont mises dans un programme de travail triennal qui est approuvé par le conseil d'administration de la banque. Et chaque année, nous faisons des mises à jour. Donc, si le contexte a changé, la priorité d'une évaluation peut, peut également changer. On peut l'enlever et mettre un sujet beaucoup plus euh, prioritaire. Donc, voilà comment nous faisons. Et dans le cadre de ce programme, nous avons des évaluations d'impact que nous conduisons. Ça va, ça va, c'était moins fréquent quelques années avant, mais de plus en plus, nous avons des évaluations d'impact que euh, BIDEF conduit dans les pays membres régionaux. Il faut savoir que... Euh, l'évaluation des projets n'est pas très fréquent à Bidev. Donc, nous, 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 c'est vrai que de temps à autre, on peut demander une évaluation d'impact de projet. Mais les évaluations systématiques des projets, c'est notamment au niveau des opérations qu'on le fait avec euh, les évaluations de, de fin de projet. Donc, je ne sais pas si j'ai répondu à la question. Juste, juste pour enrichir un peu la question, parce qu'on on, on a aussi une, tout à fait un autre on va, euh, axe de travail sur le secteur privé, qui est se fait par notre équipe d'Adoa. Et effectivement, il, il fait aussi le travail sur l'impact evaluation, l'évaluation des impacts au niveau du secteur privé, au niveau de. Euh, alors, en fait, ce que je veux aussi ajouter, c'est vrai, on a une grande politique d'impact. Euh, sur le secte souverain, ce qu'on dit souverain, c'est-à-dire que le projet secte public. Pourtant, on a tout une, euh, un élément, en fait, et Patrick, euh, dans la session suivante, peut dire peut-être aussi quelque chose sur l'impact evaluation. Ils ont aussi une, une axe de travail qui est bien ciblée sur le, sur le travail d'impact. 
notamment au secteur privé, la façon que, quand on fait un financement dans le secteur privé, ou sur une banque, ou sur une ligne de crédit, ou un projet d'investissement, euh, euh, comment, comment on assure qu'il y a un bon impact de, de ce projet et les ressources sont bien utilisées. Merci beaucoup. Richard, il y a une question peut-être que tu peux essayer, auquel tu peux essayer, une question à laquelle tu pourras répondre. La banque soutient-elle les pays à améliorer la qualité à l'entrée des projets? Euh, oui, mais en fait, ce serait bien, en fait, euh, oui, on a tout à fait, en fait, c'est notre... Notre institution, il est en fait assez large. Effectivement, on a une institution financière monde, c'est-à-dire qu'on finance a priori le projet. Pourtant, on a toute une équipe à I4 et un peu à IDEF, mais surtout I4 qui, qui est en fait leur seul but. Leur seul but, c'est vraiment de partager le connaissance de la banque au niveau des pays, y compris pour le projet, en fait, comment en fait on prépare un projet dans le propre sens. Euh, 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 si vous voulez, en fait, on peut vous donner quelques noms, mais en fait, c'est plutôt I4 que notre, knowledge, notre centre de, de partage de connaissances, si on peut le dire comme ça, euh, euh, peut, peut, peut bien répondre, mais c'est eux. Et on a même assisté hier à un atelier qui, qui, se, qui, euh, qui cible justement ça, euh, soutenir le, le, la préparation de projets au Niger. On a fait des ateliers aussi en Angola. Mais ce que je propose, c'est mieux de contacter notre centre de, de connaissances, de partage de connaissances, I4, et comme ça, elle peut mettre comme indiqué des badous. C'est un peu la même chose. Ils ont un programme de travail. C'est effectivement eux de, de mettre dedans ou pas. Euh, mais c'est ça, le, en fait, euh, euh, le bon approche. Euh, si je n'ai pas bien répondu à votre question, n'hésite pas de, de revenir. OK, for Debazu, uh, maybe you can talk about a uh, junior consultant. The question is, do you have a plan to support young African individual evaluators? Um, um, merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, like I said, um, we can't provide uh, direct assistance to individuals. Uh, it will not be possible. What we do is through the African Evaluation Association, we have, we have uh, experience providing them, supporting their program. So whatever program they have, like the Young Evaluator the program that they have, we support them and they are in a position to replicate this support to individuals. And uh, like, uh, thank you, Joseph, for pointing it out. We recruit, we recruit junior consultants. Junior consultants, according to bank standard, are people who have at least a master, who have less than five years of experience, and who have the, the knowledge that is necessary to carry out evaluation uh, in some fields. So we recruit those uh, young consultants and we we bring them in our evaluation team to support, to assist, and also to learn how our, we conduct our evaluation, how we disseminate our results, and how we, we, we manage uh, uh, in terms of administrative management of our evaluation. So those are the way we provide support. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Debasu. Uh, thank you for that response. Uh, I think we have to close this particular session. Uh, thank you, colleagues, for all your interventions. Um, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Debasu, for providing adequate answers and clarifications. I think now, uh, colleagues, let us proceed to the next group of presentations. I have the pleasure to invite Mr. Armo Enzemana and Mr. Sabri Ben Mafta to present the lessons learned on project startup delays. Over to you, Armo. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madhu, and good morning, colleagues. Um, oh, there you go. So, uh, thank you very much to uh, uh, BDEV uh, for this opportunity um, to share with us, um, to give us the opportunity to share with you some of the key findings of, of this study. Uh, and the lessons learned. So um, 
the study on project startup delays was initiated in 2018 and continued throughout of last year um, in the context of the presidential directive aimed at accelerating um, delivery of public sector projects and, and particularly requiring projects to start dispersing within six months from approval. Um, Sabrina, in the interest of time, you can move to slide two, please. Yes, next one, please. There you go. So very early on when the directive was released, uh, it became quite clear that the vast majority of our sovereign projects, our public sector projects, could not meet this six month target. Uh, as you can see on this slide, it takes an average of 15 months from approval to first disbursement. So six months is, is, is clearly a stretch target. Um, the purpose of this study was therefore to understand and analyze the critical bottlenecks that are standing in the way of achieving this uh, six months target and draw the key lessons from this study. Next slide. And, and here, uh, uh, let, me, let me ask Sabri to take you through some of the uh, methodology and the key findings of the study, and I'll come back on the lessons learned. Sabri, over to you. Yes. Uh, okay. Thanks, Armand. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, I will, uh, like uh, Armand said, I will quickly uh, take you through uh, the uh, the uh, methodology of uh, the study and uh, the findings we uh, we draw we draw from uh, this study. So, uh, as you see in this uh, slide, the the study. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, four methods contributed to this study. Uh, the study was based on a desk review of uh, seven, 742 sovereign investment projects approved between uh, 2000. And 2018, an active uh, review of uh, the club team also uh, in another perspective. It was uh, supplemented by discussions targeting uh, task management, challenges in startup delays, and uh, the, what, uh, what uh, lessons learned they, they can share with us. Uh, we did also uh, three case, case studies in uh, three RMCs, which are Cameroon, Uganda, and Senegal. So these are all the, the qualitative and quantitative data we did to, uh, to draw some lessons and uh, to, to, uh, to share. Uh, factors in uh, in this this slide as you can see so it's drawn from a uh, uh, project approval and first disbursement uh, against the the, the, the the cumulative proportion of dispersed projects so here you see the cumulative disbursement uh, the cumulative proportion of dispersed project and here uh, the uh, the months uh, from approval to, to first disbursement as you can see only nine percent uh, of the uh, of the projects in the portfolio were able to disperse to first disperse in uh, in the first six months within the six months and uh, 40 only 45 percent were able to uh, to start dispersing in, uh, in within uh, within 12 months which is one year and so 55 percent of the sample of operations uh, dispersed after one year um so this 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 is an evidence of the the, the importance 
of uh, startup delays in this uh, in this operation in, this, in the investment operations. Um, this this another this is another perspective which also uh, gives an idea about uh, the startup delays. Uh, here we plot we plot the disbursement rate, the disbursement rate of the, the portfolio against its age. So here you see 10% uh, uh, cumulative disbursement rate and so on up to 100% in this sample of 2013 to 2018 approvals against its age, uh, which is uh, zero to, uh, to eight years or, and so on. Um, so here we, 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 can, uh, we can see that this scatter plot, we can see that we can see that uh, there is a slow takeoff, a slow takeoff uh, up to two years. So you see that in average, uh, it takes two years to reach 6% in average. Uh, and uh, three years to reach 70% uh, 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 cumulative disbursement rate in average also. And uh, at the age, uh, the average age of 5.7 years, we are at uh, almost 64%, uh, which uh, so uh, delays the completion of projects and so on. And uh, brings also a lot of aging operation, which you see in this. Uh, In this uh, interval of six beginning uh, in the methodology, uh, a project completed between 2013 and 2018. And uh, we, uh, we noticed that these projects uh, take two years take two years to, uh, to uh, start dispersing against the target of the PD02-2015, uh, which is recent, uh, but these are all the projects they take, they took two years. So, uh, which uh, had an impact on their uh, plan duration. So the, the duration was, the, the average duration was five years and uh, uh, the actual duration was eight years. So uh, it's uh, basically a, an extension, an average extension or delay of three, of three years. And uh, uh, startup delays contribute significantly, significantly to, to, uh, to this uh, three years uh, of delay. Uh, with that, I will give uh, the floor back to Armand to, uh, to, uh, to provide the lessons learned and the success factors shared by the, the task managers and uh, what we learned from the case studies and so on. Thanks, thanks, colleagues. Thank you very much, uh, Sabrin. Um, so let's now turn to lessons learned. Um, number one, uh, the study showed a contrasting picture across regional member countries for signature and ratification processes um, with significant variances in the speed and the level of efficiency um, to reach loan effectiveness, um, depending on, on the respective constitutional regimes from one country to another. Best practices observed in a few countries suggest that a robust and pragmatic legal framework for loan ratification, Parliament should delegate borrowing authority to the executive uh, branch and, and exercise its parliamentary over oversight through the annual budgetary process. So a typical um, example would be Senegal. Um, so essentially approving the annual borrowing plan and setting operational debt ceiling uh, instead of reviewing and ratifying each loan agreement as it, it currently is the case for most um, in most countries uh, in Africa. Next slide, please. So 
once a loan is signed and ratified, there are still many other bottlenecks before reaching first disbursement, uh, as it is summarized in this slide. Um, conditions for first disbursement associated with compensation payments, resettlement, um, concession arrangement, uh, all these um, various requirements result in long delays. Uh, particularly at this time when government budgets are tight. Um, I've seen a number of, of, of projects, uh, for instance, in, in East Africa recently, that showed delays in, in releasing compensation payments. So that has a significant impact, uh, impact on achieving first disbursement uh, timelines. The vast majority of public investment projects are approved within, without updated feasibility studies. And, and bidding documents, procurement documents. So you usually spend um, about first six months of recruiting consultants um, after approval, after board approval, to update studies and, and start preparing bidding documents. So all these factors do uh, uh, add to to the delays in kicking off a project and 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 and, and starting dispersing. Next slide, please. In terms of success factors, um, uh, during uh, the study, we identified very few success stories, in fact. Uh, but one particular project in Morocco caught our attention, and that's the Projet de Renforcement des Infrastructures in Casablanca. Uh, so that project was dispersed within 5.5 months, so sh uh, just, sh just shy of the, um, just below the six months target. Uh, so this is a project which was designed on the back of a previously completed project. So that's a, an important factor. If you, if you have follow-up projects, that is always very helpful. And if the feasibility studies were pre-financed, so in this case, the feasibility studies and the bidding documents were pre-financed by the government of Morocco prior to board approval. So these are obviously very difficult conditions to meet for most regional member countries with limited institutional capacity and resources. But these are essential conditions for accelerated delivery of our project. If we don't find a way to pre-finance these studies, um, if we don't uh, ensure strong ownership on the country level, if we don't have procurement documents uh, already prepared ahead of board approval, um, uh, these are critical steps that really um, make a huge difference in terms of accelerating delivery just immediately after uh, approval. Next slide, please. So on this last slide, we also highlight how we can also improve on our own internal tools, starting with uh, the readiness filters, I think uh, Richard in his previous presentation mentioned the readiness review. Um, it, we've done a lot of improvement over the years, but there's still perhaps further efforts that need to be made on the implementation readiness um, with particular attention to updated feasibility studies. These are not currently an absolute requirement under the readiness review. So you continue to have projects that are being approved today uh, where the, the, the studies are still outdated or in, incomplete or outdated. And that also delays significantly um, the uh, startup phase of, of, of projects. Um, preparing country loan effectiveness roadmaps and sector disbursement profiles is also very helpful to identify ahead of time these bottlenecks and start addressing them and, and also to prepare more realistic disbursement plans. As we've seen um, in one of the previous slides um, presented by, by Sabri, um, most of our investment projects are planned to be completed within five years. The reality is um, the vast majority of them do not, are not completed before um, seven or eight years after approval. That's the reality on the ground. So um, um, there's a need for more realism in the way we plan for uh, 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 the implementation 
of our investment projects. So I'll stop here um, and, and Sabri and I are uh, available for further questions on the study and the follow-up work that we're doing uh, on these lessons learned. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Armo and uh, Sabri. Thank you for this insightful presentation, uh, for sharing, uh, sharing with us the results of your fresh analysis on the lessons and uh, lessons on the delays at the project startup. Uh, thank you. Um, I would now like to invite Mr. Patrick Mabusa for his presentation on the bank's ADOA framework and tools. Uh, over to you, Patrick. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. May you please allow me to share my screen? Of course, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my presentation will be on the Adora framework and tools. I'm going to be as uh, quick as possible in order to meet your, 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 your time constraints. Uh, we are going to talk about the ADOA mandate and the definition of ADOA, also discuss the additionality and development outcomes assessment. And also I'm going to share some lesson learned so far. Uh, the mandate of ADOA is really to provide independent ex ante additionality and development outcome assessment of private sector operations. It acts as a decision making tool. And it also to provide <clears throat> advisory function in project design in order to improve quality at entry of projects. It also lay a foundation for ex post monitoring and evaluation by providing a reporting, a development outcome reporting template that is gonna be used by those who are involved in export monitoring of projects. Then in terms of defining a door, I think it's defined in two, in two concepts. The first one being additionality and the second one being development outcomes. In terms of additionality, we, 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 we ask ourselves, what does the bank along with other participating DFIs bring to an operation that commercial investors cannot bring? If we bring something that commercial investors already bring or can bring, so we assume that there is no additionality that we are making in that particular project. Then the second aspect is development outcomes. We here we ask ourselves, what are the development outcomes that can be expected from the operation or from the project itself? We are going to discuss with, uh, about this as we go down. Then the, 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 the additionality itself, the additionality assessment is categorized into three dimensions as well which looks at po political risk mitigation, financial additionality, improved design and standards. So in terms of, 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 of political risk mitigation, the bank look at what, what is it that you are bringing in, in terms of re reducing exposure to government adverse actions or else are we bringing any guarantee or insurance that is going to help mitigate political risk? And then if maybe the answer is no to all those questions that we ask ourselves in that aspect, it means you are not maybe adding any additionality in terms of mitigating of political risk in that respect. Then the financial additionality part it, help, it has to do more about the funding terms that we provide. Are we providing better funding terms compared to commercial financial institutions or private sector investors that are also willing to invest in this, in this uh, particular project? Is there a need for maybe hard currency? 
is our participating also help in terms of affordability of the service that would be provided? Or also, are we also catalyzing any private sector investors into the project by just part participating in this particular project? Are we also, maybe another question would be asking yourself, are we addressing any market failure or liquidity constraints? Or are we helping in terms of developing a missing market? So if the answer is yes to all this, then it, it shows that there is additionality that you are bringing to the project. Then the, the last aspect of Sorry, sir, please, can you share the slides, please? Can you share your screen? We cannot see anything. You can't see the, 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 the screen. No, you don't share. Oh, okay. Let me share again. Oh, okay. Oh, I've gone a long way without without you telling me that I'm not sharing. I'm, 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 I'm trying to see why I'm not sharing it. Okay. Uh, screen share. Just click on share screen uh, yeah. button on Zoom. Do, do you see any? Yes, it's coming. It's coming. Thank you. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, there's something that is, uh, okay, let's sort it out, just closing my screen here. Yeah, then in, in the last aspect is improved design and, and standards. And uh, in, in that case, we look at the project design to maximize development uh, outcomes or likelihood of achievement. Is there anything that you are adding in that aspect as a, as a bank also on monitoring of, of development outcomes. Let's say maybe the systems that are, that the customer has, I mean, is not adequate enough to monitor the development outcomes of the project so that you'll be able to track them over time. So we can advise for that particular client to really put in place those, those systems. And also, are we bringing any capacity building through technical assistance that will help I mean, capacitate the, the, the client uh, personnel in order to be able to deliver on the project itself. Those are positive additionality that we, are, we can talk about under improved design and standards. Then this is just an example of uh, information that you will want to see in terms of additionality. For instance, if, it, if it's a project finance on energy project, I'm not going to discuss them. And then all the development outcomes categories. We have seven subcategories under the development outcomes, which the first one has to do with the household benefits and, and, and job creation. Asking yourself, how many jobs are the, is this project is going to create? Is it going to improve goods or maybe it's bringing in new, new, new goods for, for, for the benefits of the, of the household? Is it going to contribute to any price reduction? And so on and so forth. Assuming it's an infrastructure project, then we are going to check whether this particular project is going to improve capacity or access or reliability and affordability and also diversity of energy sources, assuming it's, a, it's, a, it's an energy project. The other aspect has to do with the governance and fiscal effects looking at the revenue flow from the projects to the government with respect to taxes, royalties, dividends, and so on. Then environmental effects and contribution to green growth. We normally get uh, information on this one from the environmental specialist, and we just include it in our, in our outdoor notes. Then there's also this regional integration and economic resilience, looking at the net forex generation or savings that is going to be brought about by you know, participating in this particular project. Or also, does this project have some regional integration aspects, which also are positive for development? Gender and social effects, then looking at the mainstreaming gender equality support to other safe sectors, segment areas, transition state, and, and, and corporate social responsibility activities. Is it adding anything to that? 
Then the private sector alleviation of financial constraints, especially to SME support, domestic value addition, local linkages and all that. If the project really support this, then it, it, it's expected to have some significant development outcomes at the end of the day. Uh, this is another example for assessing development outcomes for project finance on energy. I'm also not going to talk about them given the constraints we have on time, but these are the information that you will want to see or to have before you, you finalize your assessment. Uh, as you can see, the ADOA process start with the concept stage and moving on to appraisal stage and also up until to board approval. Then at up, board, from the board approval onwards, our participation is very limited. The only thing we do, we, 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 we issue a DO tracking and reporting template to be included in the legal uh, agreement that will be used by those who will be conducting the monitoring and also the, 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 the export analysis of the DO out, outcomes. Uh, I will also like to share some lesson learned, uh, Chaperson, if time uh, allows me. Uh, what we have really seen so far is that there is a lack of a close feedback feedback loop between ex ante and export assessment. We think there is a need to improve communication between ex ante and export teams. The outdoor assessment only ends, this is because the outdoor assessment only ends at board stage and little visibility at implementation and operation stage is, is, is being observed. So the Adwa team needs to know how well its indicators are collected, monitored, and documented. Also, the lesson learned from ex post needs to be feedbacked to ex ante assessment stage to improve Adwa quality. Improve interaction with other results measurement units within the bank is also paramount in order to see or also to be able to identify the weaknesses of the ex ante process and also improve it accordingly. The other limitation we have is the I mean, challenge or lesson. We have realized that it is important to educate stakeholders, especially the ecosystem due to high turnover. For example, the board is one of the key stakeholders of ADOA, but due to high board turnover sometimes, regular sensitization activities are paramount to adequately inform new board members about our roles and, and responsibilities. Also, sensitization should be extended to new investment officers to understand the needs of ADOA and also what is ADOA's part in the <clears throat> project assessment up until to implementation stage. We have realized that not a major issue for management since the, the, those personnel tend to be relatively stable over time. But we do realize that there is a need for regular updating of management on outdoor activities. Another lesson that we have also learned over time is that there is a need to build information system to maintain institutional memory. Due to staff, staff turnover at the, at the ADOA division. So it is necessary to put in place an information system that documents and archives information on ADOA activities. This will make it easy to preserve institutional memory and have a system that is resilient to unanticipated staff turnover. Such a system will also help we will also make it easy to onboard the new ADOA staff members. I would like to say that, uh, Chairperson, that the, 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 TV, the ADOA division actually is currently developing an ADOA platform that will address most of these issues that we have already identified. Then the last uh, slide's presentation is about the close collaboration with other MPBs and DFIs. 
we've realized that this collaboration is very important to ensure awareness about the latest thinking and new methodologies on proper measurement of development impacts. To share experiences and identify new development outcomes indicators is also important. General knowledge sharing to improve staff capacity will also, is also important in terms of collaborating with these other institutions. But we will want, I will want to, to emphasize, Chairperson, that the ADOA team is already playing a role, an active role in HIPSO activities, and this has helped the unit to sharpen its assessment work through collaboration with other members of the, with other staff members from MTPs and DFIs alike. Chairperson, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Patrick, uh, for this very informative presentation on the bank's ADOA framework and uh, uh, the lessons that follow for um, determined of the, of the way we do the business. Um, colleagues, now the floor is open for discussion. As I have requested earlier, please make your questions as brief as possible. Uh, we have already received some questions. Um, Joseph, uh, could you check the French uh, questions in the Q&A uh, section? Okay, uh, um, do I say it in French for translator or do you want me to translate it? No, the translators would translate. Uh, you could read it out uh, as such. Okay, good. Uh, the, I think the first question in English was, what are the main reasons for the delay? Uh, we have part of the answer in the, the presentation, but if I can take it again, no problem. So in French, uh, uh, quelle est la nature des projets les plus concernés par ce retard de démarrage? Uh... Deuxième question, Just, I don't know where to follow. I, I, I cannot read all the French question. Maybe we, can, we, we need to go question by question. Otherwise, it will be difficult for translation. Maybe that is better. Thank yeah. You. So this was a question to Armand. So all, all the question we have so far is for Armand team. OK. OK. Um, so thank you very much for the questions. I'll try to answer in um, those um, raised in, in English, I'll try to answer them in English and those in French, I'll um, uh, be courteous enough to, to answer in French as well. Um, so the first one, um, the reasons for these delays, as, as, as we presented um, in, um, in, uh, in, uh, during the presentation, I think there's basically two buckets of, of reasons for, for these delays. First, there's the time, the time during um, um, to, to achieve loan effectiveness. Um, the, the signature and ratification process in the countries. And, and, and surprisingly, uh, when you look at the various constitutional arrangements that you have in, in Africa compared to other continents, you see uh, a parliament uh, which takes a very active role in uh, reviewing uh, and ratifying projects um, and delegating very little to, to the executive branch uh, as opposed to um, other constitutional regimes you have in Europe and elsewhere. So as a result of that, uh, because you don't have that delegated authority to be able to um, um, take loans uh, afforded to the, the executive branch uh, within, of course, a certain threshold, um, budgetary threshold, then um, you end up having very, very long um, ratification processes uh, for our projects. So this is a, an issue that is not only affecting the African Development Bank, but all the um, development institutions operating on the continent. 
So clearly, uh, this is something we need to uh, we need to address. Uh, but there are interesting cases, interesting um, best practices that we see in countries such as Senegal that have a very um, progressive approach to this, uh, where um, the during the annual budget process, uh, the pipeline of projects under discussion with the government are presented to the parliament. Um, and, and on that basis, a ceiling is set and um, uh, a clearance is provided to the executive branch to go ahead and make, uh, take loan, uh, sign loan agreements on behalf of, of, of the country of the government. Uh, the second question I think uh, was in French, uh, quels sont les types de projets qui uh, souffrent uh, le plus grand nombre, le plus grand, le, le, la proportion plus élevée de, de retard uh, dans uh, l'exécution et particulièrement durant, ce, durant cette partie, cette, uh, cette uh, période uh, de démarrage des projets. Uh, alors, la présentation uh, uh, parle d'une façon générale des projets d'investissement du secteur privé, uh, pardon, du secteur public. Uh, cela concerne pratiquement uh, l'ensemble des secteurs d'investissement, que ce soit le secteur des transports, le secteur de l'énergie, euh, euh, l'eau et l'assainissement. Euh, euh, tous ces secteurs sont touchés par ce problème de retard dans le, le démarrage des projets. Euh, on note néanmoins au niveau de la Banque africaine de développement euh, une performance légèrement supérieure euh, dans les projets du secteur des transports euh, pour une raison, euh, pour plusieurs raisons en fait. La première, c'est que euh, il s'agit d'un secteur pour lequel nous avons euh, des agences d'exécution très expérimentées qui sont en place depuis, euh, qui sont, qui ont de fortes des, des, des institutions solides. Euh, euh, ça, c'est la première raison. La deuxième raison, nous avons également euh, des études qui sont préfinancées de phase antérieure, euh, ce, cela permet euh, de pouvoir accélérer euh, le financement ou le démarrage de phase ultérieure. Euh, donc, euh, la Banque africaine souvent finance des programmes d'investissement dans le secteur des transports qui, euh, qui euh, comprennent plusieurs phases et donc les phases ultérieures sont en général exécutées beaucoup plus facilement. Euh, nous n'avons pas ces facteurs de succès dans les autres secteurs d'investissement comme l'énergie, euh, l'eau et l'assainissement et d'autres où euh, les, les démarrages sont beaucoup plus lents, prennent beaucoup plus de temps. En gros, euh, ce sont plus ou moins les aspects que nous avons observés dans le cadre de cette étude. Thank you. OK. L'autre question, quel est l'impact de ces prolongations sur la rentabilité de ces investissements? Alors, excellente question. Alors, les, les retards, lorsque vous avez un programme, un projet euh, qui euh, est financé et planifié sur une période de cinq ans, mais dont la durée s'étale sur sept, huit ans, comme on le voit dans la plupart des projets d'investissement de la banque, il y a plusieurs impacts. Le premier, c'est au niveau des coûts. Les coûts, euh, on, le, on le voit souvent dans, par exemple, les programmes, de, les projets de financement de, de route, où on voit qu'il euh, y a de nombreux avenants euh, pour euh, non seulement l'extension de la période, euh, mais également euh, des, des coûts additionnels euh, et des imprévus qui, qui sont encourus euh, en raison donc, de cette durée euh, beaucoup plus longue. Donc, ça entraîne des coûts. Euh, pour l'emprunteur, il y a également des coûts qui sont associés au, euh, ce qu'on appelle euh, les, les coûts d'engagement. Lorsque euh, vous avez contracté un prêt et vous, avez, euh, vous utilisez une partie relativement faible de, euh, du financement, euh, le reste, le montant non décaissé euh, entraîne des coûts d'engagement, n'est-ce pas? Donc, ça, c'est un coût additionnel pour l'emprunteur. Alors, mais l'impact le, le plus important qu'il faut, je crois, retenir pour une, 
pour une institution de développement, c'est l'impact sur les bénéficiaires. Pour un programme d'électrification euh, qui euh, sert une communauté, euh, lorsqu'il est planifié euh, d'être finalisé en déant 5 ans et qu'il prend 8 ans, il faut garder à l'esprit que 8 ans, ça correspond euh, à euh, tout un cycle euh, d'écoles, d'études secondaires. Et ça va jusqu'à l'université. Cela veut dire que les enfants qui vivent dans ces communautés vont passer toute la période de leurs études secondaires sans électricité, sans pouvoir, euh, euh, pouvoir lire, préparer leurs leur cours euh, le soir pendant toute la période de leurs études secondaires. Voilà la, le véritable impact de ces retards. Donc, c'est une véritable course contre la montre pour pouvoir justement euh, pouvoir répondre à cette aspiration euh, de, 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 de développement accéléré euh, auquel nous faisons face. Voilà le véritable coût donc, de, de ces retards. Merci. Do we have more questions? Uh, yeah, 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 we, we have more questions. I'm trying to be a little yeah. bit selective. So the next yeah. one is in English. Project delay are usually, re usually reduced with the use of national procurement system. What progress has been made by the bank in this regard? The use This of is, uh, national procurement yeah, system. So this is an excellent question. Um, the bank has made significant progress in this area in the context of the um, uh, um, a new uh, policy uh, procurement framework, which was adopted Um, I believe uh, a couple of years ago, um, which uh, applies a, a risk-based approach and tries to um, identify opportunities for utilizing more uh, country systems uh, where applicable, where the capacities are available, uh, where the resources are available. There is that uh, move towards utilizing more Uh, local um, uh, country country systems um, on procurement. Um, so we are moving in the right direction in that area. Are we moving fast enough? That's another question. But uh, there are significant progress that are being made in the context of this new policy framework. Thank you. You want me to continue or uh, Madhu? I think... Um, uh... We are really running late. Uh, <laughs> uh, there are some more questions. I think uh, those we can take up subsequently uh, online. Okay, uh, good. Now, now, colleagues, uh, considering the uh, thank you for all the interventions. Uh, there are some questions which we haven't yet answered uh, that we will be taking up uh, online subsequently. Uh, thank you, Arno, uh, Sabri, and Patrick for providing your. Um, insightful answers uh, and clarifications. Um, now, colleagues, considering the limited time at our disposal, let us move on to the next group of presentations. May I invite um, Mr. Justin Eckert for his presentation on the bank's environmental and social safeguards framework. Justin, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to do the presentation on the bank's environmental and social framework. I hope you can see my screen now. Yes. Yes, we are able to. Um, okay. So basically, This framework this framework is the anchored on the first on the fact that environmental and social safeguards is applied throughout the project cycle with 
various requirements at various stages of the project cycle, but I'll come back to the details on that. Uh, secondly, the framework also recognizes that the bank's safeguards requirements are actually applied in tandem with the national requirements. In other words, we do not the additional requirement sorry requirements as may be imposed by the national environment management agencies in terms of the bank uh, integrated safeguard system, the structure of the environment assessment requirements includes the procedures, it includes the guidance notes, it includes the operational safeguards themselves, which stipulates the requirements which the borrowers are expected to comply with, and the bank commitments as contained in the at the very beginning are categorized to set the frame for the borrowers to comply with the various requirements under each category of operation financed by the bank for category one projects i think the task managers know well very well that it's a requirement to prepare full environmental social impact assessment uh, and resettlement action plans where these are applicable. For category two operations, they're expected to prepare environment and social management plans, which are dictated normally by the site specific circumstances. And for category three operations, those do not require any assessments. For category involving financial intermediary or certain types of corporate entities, they're normally expected to pre prepare environment and social management systems. Now, in terms of quality at entry, at the preparation phase, it's normally expected that environmental and social assessment studies and the associated consultations, as well as the due diligence by the borrower and the bank are actually undertaken in order to align the relevant financed operations with bank policies, procedures, as well as the country requirements. At that stage, we also expect that once those studies have been completed by the borrowers, the relevant ESA studies reviews and disclosure is undertaken. Uh, task managers and stakeholders may wish to know that we have lifted this particular process up to the preparation phase as opposed to the previous conduct of this particular due diligence at appraisal because of the challenges faced with especially the disclosure requirements for category one projects which demanded 120 days so to accommodate that the due diligence for all this documentation and their preparation we want to the extent possible to be done by their preparation stage so the actions at that stage is that experts participate in these preparation missions. They assess and review the documentation prepared by the borrowers and subject them to the necessary due diligence. And if these are, have been finalized, they should receive authorization by the borrower so that they are disclosed upstream by the preparation phase. Of course, those are the outputs. We expect that the ASIA should be complete. The ESMPs and settlement action plan should be completed and the relevant ENS concluded in the PCNs. Now, in terms of quality at entry, it is expected that by the PCN preparation stage, by the PCN readiness review, 
the aspect of categorization should have been resolved and validated between the bank and the borrower. And it is also expected that the operation should have complied by the bank group's environmental social safeguards requirements in terms of both procedures and compliance with the operational safeguards. And of course, once that is done, it's also expected that should and be followed by further requirements. One of the most important aspects to know at that stage is evaluation of the capacity to implement the provisions of those studies. And I now that by that appraisal stage, all the bank safeguard requirements will have been fulfilled in terms of policies, all the necessary consultations will have been done, the disclosures will have been done, and should those studies should show evidence that there is clear budget for implementation of the safeguards requirements. Knowing very well that poor budgeting for ENS management are during implementation has been one of the key challenges. Again, institutional capacity, there has to be evidence that the client has the capacity to implement the safeguards requirements. Now, if all these requirements are found adequate, it is now a requirement that an environmental actual compliance note is issued as an annex to the project appraisal document. And I think most of the task managers now are familiar with the requirement for the envir environmental and social compliance note, which states in detail the minimum requirements which should have been completed by the project appraisal phase. And again, just like at the PCN, the readiness review at the project appraisal stage should state very clearly that the project is ready or not to provide presentation. This is just an outline of what the ESCO looks like. I am not going to go into the details. But what is important to note in the ESCON is that the clear demands that we state in certain terms whether the project is compliance with the bank's environmental social safeguards requirements and should be submitted to the board. And it only expects two answers, yes or no. And of course, I think it's in everybody's interest that the answer should be yes. Uh, in terms of some challenges, we now see that one of the key factors is a need for clarity in financial resources for compensation of project affected person that has turned out to be one of the major challenges for implementation startup because for infrastructure projects once project affected persons have not been compensated there is no way works can commence the other aspect in terms of quality attend challenges is the fact that all parties need to be clear that the time required for preparation of environmental social impact assessment studies and resettlement action plans needs to be factored into the, the whole project processing timeline to avoid a conflict between readiness of those studies and the board presentation dates. And this has been flagged out from various evaluations. Now, during implementation, again, it's the responsibility of the borrowers to implement the covenants in the environmental social management plans, in the resettlement action, plan, in the environmental social management systems for FIs and corporate loans, and to monitor their implementation and report regularly to the bank on performance in terms of ENS compliance. The bank retains the responsibility to provide implementation support through supervision to ensure that the requirements as embedded in the loan agreements, in the ESMPs, in the ESMS are met by the clients. And of course, that goes also alongside the country approval requirements. Now, some of the key principles which everyone 
involved in the process needs to watch out is that there is there has to be compliance with the safeguard condition. set out in the loan agreement, which is often very well clearly stated in certifications or licensing regime relevant to the operation in question. Uh, it is also a cardinal principle that implementation of the entire operation should go alongside implementation of the mitigation measures, resettlement action plan covenants, and the environmental social management systems, which are relevant to the operations. And of course, we have now taken a step to ensure that each of the operations maintains and retains a safeguards officer who remains part of the project team and will be responsible for implementation support to ensure compliance to all ENS requirements. Previously, previous evaluations have also pointed out that during the implementation phase, Reporting on performance on environmental social safeguards has been a very big challenge, especially, especially there has been low level of reporting on ENS compliance alongside other parameters and no standardization of reporting due to lack of guidance on required standard reporting templates, which have been provided to all project teams for operations financed by the bank to address that challenge. It has also been observed in previous evaluations that the performance on environmental and social safeguards compliance disappears at the project completion reporting. And now we, we believe that regular reporting, improved reporting on a regular basis should be a basis for periodic updates on performance on ENS, which should better inform and contribute to meaningful preparation of project completion reports from the an ENS perspective. Uh, I'll conclude with some general ENS issues to pay attention to. Of course, some of the operations are implemented in countries in transition which lack capacity to implement ENS requirements and capacity building is key. In voluntary resettlement and associated compensation remains a major challenge for effective implementation of ENS requirements. And of course, failure to consult stakeholders adequately, risk collision with various stakeholders, especially civil society. And we also know that non-compliance on ENS risks project being referred to the bank's independent review mechanism, which nobody would wish to happen to his or her operation. And of course, the quality of environmental and social assessment studies matters in terms of delivery of compliance. In terms of costs of non-compliance, we urge all operations and all actors to ensure that operations financed by the bank comply with ENS requirements because non-compliance brings high reputational risk to the bank, especially through harming people, through degrading the environment, or through increasing complaints against these operations. Uh, there is also negative and direct risk in terms of health, income, property loss or critical biodiversity loss. And non-compliance is also often a cause for project execution delays, which would lead into cost overruns. And also non-compliance can undermine the intended positive benefits of these development operations. So in brief, that's what I would say about the framework for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Justin, very much for this detailed and insightful presentation. Um, now, let us move to the next presentation. I would like to invite uh, Ms. Lynette Meriti to present the bank's gender framework. Lynette, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. If, uh, okay, yes, I've been allowed to share my screen. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, just allow me to, to start sharing my screen. And um, I don't have very good internet um, connections today. So if I have a problem with the connection, I shall turn off my video just to make sure that um, I'm able to, 
to, to make the presentation. So I'm going to talk about the gender framework and generally gender mainstreaming and um, uh, what we are doing in the bank uh, in support of, um, of gender mainstreaming. I'm going to be very brief and I'm going to talk about very quickly around the background and context, which is really the, the framing uh, of gender work in the bank. And then I'm going to talk about the main framework we use for gender mainstreaming, which is the gender market system. And finally, I'm going to talk about our support as the gender department to, uh, to the gender mainstreaming working operations. Um, and uh, to start off, I want to start by mentioning that um, gender mainstreaming is an area of emphasis in the 10 year strategy. So this is a corporate, um, it's a corporate priority as opposed to a priority of the gender department. So, and we've had a gender strategy that's uh, soon to expire uh, that sought to operationalize that commitment. Now, a new gender strategy is being developed and we expect it to go to the board in the coming few weeks. And it will continue the work uh, that was started in the previous strategy. And we'll look at um, decreasing gender inequalities across Africa. Um, so our, our purpose of gender mainstreaming the mainstreaming is not a goal in itself, but we do so in order to reduce the gender inequalities across the continent. And um, the new strategy will be focusing on access to finance, enhancing technical skills and gender responsive infrastructure. But more will come once that is approved uh, because it's not yet been approved. So in a nutshell, um, corporately, this is anchored in the banks uh, key uh, strategy document. Now, I also wanted to mention and draw your attention that in addition to this, the bank has made very specific commitments under the ADF 15, as well as the GCI. I haven't listed the GCI commitments here, but they are quite similar to the ADF 15. Some are similar to the ADF 15 gender commitments. They are commitments um, on energy related uh, initiatives, uh, in terms of uh, projects being categorized, and I'm going to talk about the decision later, they are um, for Feed Africa, 100% of projects would need to use the gender marker system, which is going to be the, my next slide, so that we see how um, we use this as a framework for gender mainstreaming. Uh, for water and sanitation as well, we have to have, um, there's a commitment to have at least 100 wash facilities in public schools um, by the end of it the ADF 15 period, uh, and that 100% of the projects also use the marker system, 50% uh, in governance, and then we have some commitments very specific to the gender department, uh, which includes uh, country gender profiles, and then also in the private sector. So what I'm emphasizing is that the commitment for gender mainstreaming cuts across the bank. So it's, I'm, I'm glad that we're having this conversation. Now, I want to talk, the next two slides are going to talk about the gender marker system, because this is the main framework that we use to, for systematized gender mainstream. Now, we recognize that not all operations can contribute to gender equality in the same way. Hence, the reason we categorize or classify the operations based on their potential to promote gender equality. So we do not want to make, uh, to, 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 to be punitive to operations that really can't make a big difference. At the same time, where operations can make a, a more difference then more is required of those operations. Uh, you know, in the previously before the GMS, we treated all operations as if they had the same potential. So it is a system to categorize operations based on their potential to promote gender equality. Now, the gender marker system has four categories. Um, and I've, I've put, you know, very brief um, um, explanations of each of these categories. The first category is what we call the Gen 1. These are operations whose goal and objective are directly addresses gender equality and women's empowerment. We have very few such operations, but we do have I know in Mali, we do have an operation that focuses on women in the Shia Bakhti 
that's a value chain. In um, Sudan, we do have an operation that looks at uh, women's uh, skills building and economic empowerment. So we do have a number of operations where the objective of it promotes gender equality. Now for such an operation, we expect a systematic gender analysis throughout the project, throughout the project cycle, but we don't expect it to have a gender action plan because the entire project focuses on gender. So the project log frame suffices. And we approximate that at least 5% of operations in the bank in the public sector would fall under this category. We do have a few as well, uh, even though we are not systematically using the system in, in the uh, non-sovereign, but we do have a few. We do have a um, uh, fund, Alithea Identity Fund, for example, that's a fund by women to support women's businesses. We do have the risk sharing facility for, from AFAWA. Those are uh, um, non-sovereign operations that would fall in this category. Now, category two, uh, projects where one or more of the outcomes uh, contributes to gender equality. It could be a transport project with uh, where there's a component, let's say, that promotes women's access to market. For this, we require an, an extensive gender analysis, and we need to have a gender action plan attached to the appraisal report. We expect that at least around 45% of operations fall into this. Now, the third category is projects where we really don't have a very direct outcome linked to gender equality, but at the output level, we have an output, it could be a gender policy developed for uh, Ministry of Energy, it could be, you know, something that's at an output level. And for this, we would need to do the gender analysis because this is what shows us what the potential of the project is. And for this, we expect 30% of operations and they need to have a gender action plan outlining these gender uh, actions. And finally, we do have category four, uh, gen four, this is, we call it marginal gender elements. These are projects that are really difficult to mainstream gender. Um, we've come across some of them. I, I think recently there was one looking at uh, Comesa energy pricing, uh, 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 an operation looking at Comesa and analysis of energy pricing. It's really difficult to mainstream gender ta tangibly in such an operation. So for this, no gender analysis is required and no uh, action plan and maybe we have 20% of operations in this. Now, I want to say that for the first three categories, we need a gender expert to be part of the project teams. Um, now, what do we do uh, to support, uh, okay, before what we do to support uh, the operations, I just will briefly mention how we categorize this project. So really, it starts with the analysis at a country, at the CP, uh, CSP level, uh, sector analysis, gender profiles, and then based on documents submitted, we ask ourselves, will the project outcome narrow gender gaps? If the answer is yes, you will ask, is gender the only objective of the project? If yes, that is a category one. If no, that is a category two. Now, back to the question, will the project outcomes really narrow gender gaps? No. Will project outputs deliver some gender-related knowledge or policy? Yes, that's a category three. No, that's a category four. I mean, I, I know I'm dashing through this and uh, we have other resources that uh, um, you can uh, look at uh, because I want to talk about how then we are supporting operations. Now, I have mentioned that gender experts are part and parcel of operations teams. So we are supporting in two levels. First, we have in each of the regional offices, we have gender experts attached to the regional offices. And these are not to pinpoint what should be done or what hasn't been done, but to be part and parcel of the design of the project. So we do, that, that's our first approach that uh, we are developing, we are designing projects together. Uh, secondly, at headquarters level, we're also saying we need a bit of quality control and review. So again, we are having a quality uh, check either through peer review or through the readiness review process. And uh, in addition, and that's by the gender department um, and it's got ex and experts in HQ. 
So the first thing we do, and we work with the specialists. If you look at the, the icons in yellow, I, I'm saying that this work is done by gender specialists and task managers because it's really supposed to be a team uh, work. So it's really initially to screen projects based on upstream work that I mentioned, whether it's CSPs, whether it's uh, studies that have been presented and proposing a GMS category. Uh, that is really at identification level. At preparation, um, gender experts working together with the task managers will include gender criteria in TORs for feasibility studies and assessments. They will conduct gender inclusive consultations during preparation missions. They will um, include preliminary gender issues in aid memoirs and other discussions, gender analysis in the project concept notes, and assign a GMS category, as well as some gender results. Now, I have focused at the preparation stage because I'm not going to go into appraisal because if we miss out on gender mainstreaming at this stage, then it's completely been missed out. Now, the, the work, the, the first two uh, bullets there, the identification and preparation is done by the gender experts in the regional centers. Now, at HQ, our experts there also review the application of the gender marker. Has the project um, done what it's supposed to do? Has it met the requirement of that gender marker category? And at HQ, the gender department also validates the category that has been assigned and says, yes, this is indeed a category two, and it has met the criteria for a category two. Now, additional support is um, training. We've had a number of trainings on the gender marker system and other issues. Uh, we have a gender module uh, coming up in the Operations Academy that now goes into details on the marker system and how to. We also do have uh, sector specific um, uh, training on gender. And I, as I mentioned, we are part of the project teams. Now, my last slide focuses on our cumulative progress to date on the gender marker system. I know it's very small on your screens, but um, I would say cumulatively, we started using the gender marker in 2018, January. Out of these 271 operations, excluding emergency projects, technical assistance and studies, these projects have been approved by the board. And of these to date, 69% have been categorized using the gender marker system. We can share these and you can see the, the results even by regional distribution. Um, to mention that if we go back to the commitments that have been made ADF and what our results are, we are getting there. We are, in some sectors, we'll need to push harder, but I would say that we are making good progress and this is the responsibility of us as gender experts as well as the uh, task managers. So I want to stop there and um, wait and see if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lide. Uh, thank you for this great presentation. Um, colleagues, uh, the floor is now open for discussion. We really look forward to uh, your active participation. Um, Joseph, could you please check if we have received any questions already? Uh, so far, we have, uh, and Lynette? we have just a few questions, no question at, uh, on gender. The only main question on uh, environmental and social safeguard is, uh, it is in French, so, est-ce que la BAD utilise, no, 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 les normes de conformité sont-elles spécifiques à des zones d'intervention? Want me to repeat the question? Hello, sorry, I'd forgotten to put my translation. So, okay, I can, I can, I can start. Les normes de conformité sont-elles spécifiques à des zones d'intervention? One Et second, one second. Yeah, sorry. Yes, now I can hear you. Yes. Good. Les normes de conformité sont-elles spécifiques à des zones d'intervention 
Exemple, l'Afrique de l'Ouest, l'Afrique australe, etc. Okay, I think I understand the question. Yeah, okay. uh, I think my answer is no. The application okay. of environmental and social safeguards requirement is always project specific and context specific. There are certain key parameters. What is the location of the project? Uh, what are the, the, the underlying baseline environmental and social conditions at the project area of implementation? Uh, what could be the likely environmental standards to be triggered? So regional or West African or East African in nature, but they are more each of the standards each operation is actually going to trigger. Uh, for instance, if, if a project is going to be implemented within a biodiversity rich area, then biodiversity inevitably becomes an, one of those operational safeguards to be triggered. And of course, that will also trigger the national regulations and requirements for protection of biodiversity, the do's and don'ts as stipulated by the national policy and also the expectation of the bank's operational safeguards regulating uh, biodiversity management. It, 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 is, it is regional or site specific from the sense of the expected footprint of the impacts, but it cannot, unless it is a regional project, we, For instance, uh, a river basin development have responded to the question. Okay, next question. Could you further elaborate on how the compliance monitoring and review has been strengthened? Okay, thank you. Uh, the question is clear enough. One of the ways we have used for strengthening compliance, review and monitoring, as I, we have issued a monitoring and reporting template to all operations. That's one. And also we have rolled out capacity building and training for all project implement. Implementation units, all executing agents for implementation of environmental social requirements on bank financed operations. And one of the key modules in this training is actually one, the basis for post approval or implementation phase monitoring what are are the key parameters to show requirements and also to standardize reporting by pro providing the basic requirements which monitoring report, whether it's in Somalia, whether it's in Tunisia or wherever. So we have attempted to schools. It goes without saying the dance and monitoring is actually the documentation, the quality of the documentation that is prepared at the preparation and appraisal phase. If these documents are not good enough, they will not be a good basis for post approval, implementation and monitoring. So we also put emphasis on supporting the borrowers in making sure that sufficient due diligence is conducted on the pre-approval documentation so that they will be useful for post-approval monitoring.
Okay, uh, Joseph, there is a question for Lynette. Um, I'll read out the question. How does the bank gender marker influence change in the roles of women, men and youth continent wide? How do you disseminate the results of the gender work done by the bank to increase the adoption of best practices? Lynette, the question is for you. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear the second part of the question. Okay. Uh, is it in the if it's in the Q and A, I can look at it. I can just read it okay. to you. I see uh, it. I see it. I see right. it. Yeah. How does Go the ahead. gender marker influence change in the roles of women, men, youth continent wide? How do you disseminate the results of gender work done by the bank to increase the adoption of best practice? Um, the first question is. Now, when I talked about gender marking and having uh, a change at the outcome level, it means that those are actual results. Now, I want to give an example um, on a project, uh, even though it came before the gender marker, but that has very interesting results in Zambia. Uh, through Cashew Infrastructure Development Project, we have, um, the project has led to women being allocated, I would say thousands of hectares of land. Now you, you, you can see that that, because that project then begins to change the roles of women and begins to change the thinking and the perceptions around women and uh, men's uh, roles um, in agriculture. So this really relates, the reason we are categorizing and putting a result on the framework is because this result is supposed to do exactly that influence change on gender relations, influence change on uh, women's economic empowerment, influence change on employment, influence change on girls' participation in STEM, whatever our areas of focus are. How do we disseminate the results of gender work done by the bank? Now, I would say this is a weak area that um, either as the uh, gender department we have, just yesterday, but we're looking at ways. Just yesterday, we launched the gender um, uh, Africa Gender Index, where we show progress on gender equality across the continent. Now, whilst this is not directly linked to bank operations, it's one of the ways in which we are showing where there's progress and where there's least progress and how we can engage more. But indeed, uh, we're also looking at other knowledge um, uh, management and dissemination strategies as a department, whether it is to do gender briefs. Um, and uh, just this week, we're actually looking at analyzing gender results in a cross-section of projects and disseminate those so that uh, we can learn from them. Uh, so uh, I would say, how do we disseminate results? Maybe not too well, but it's an area of learning that we are looking at. Thank you. Thank you, Lynette. And, uh, Lynette, Lynette uh, another question. Did the gender department involve in the identification of beneficiaries? Yes, we are involved in the identification of beneficiaries, and that's why gender experts need to be part of, part of the project teams as early as possible. Um, and influence even the project components and the beneficiaries and the actual target numbers. And, and there are some really good results we have seen from uh, women being involved in road construction and, and, and um, being trained for, for road maintenance in Namibia. Uh, so we are involved, we are involved in, in, in identification of beneficiaries because the idea is not to wait until the project is designed but to be part and parcel, and that's one of our roles. Thank you. Okay, on uh, SafeGuard, is uh, your department uh, doing annual review of key project or thematic review to improve the effective implementation of environment and social mitigation measures? Uh, yes, and uh, I'm happy to, to note that this is perhaps one of the outcomes of either the evaluation of the 
because one of the weaknesses reporting on a quarterly basis that in itself translated to poor evaluation of the operations on an annual basis. So we have now put emphasis first on mandatory quarterly reporting on ENS and that should contribute to mandate. On top of that, we also have made it mandatory for annual performance audits for all operations, especially category one and category two, for ensuring that all operations financed by the bank conduct these annual performance audits. And it has actually already so far been very effective. We are receiving a lot of good annual performance audits from an ENS perspective. Of course, just to add is that this is not the responsibility of the bank. Our responsibility is to provide them the tools. We prefer that the actual conduct of the annual performance audits is conducted by the borrowers and the clients. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Justin. Uh, I think Joseph, uh, uh, other questions if we have, let us take it online subsequently. Uh, okay. We are really running uh, a little late, um, but uh, thank you, thank you, Justin. Thank you, uh, Lynette, for providing your answers. Much appreciated, very useful. Um, colleagues, um, this brings us uh, pretty much towards the end of the session. Um, I would say a, a few concluding words, uh, not definitely uh, trying to uh, summarize or summarize the main take home uh, from this session. We have really uh, had very stimulating discussion and uh, learning on some very key issues related to the bank's operations. I would, I would like to put on record IDEV's appreciation for the excellent presentations and um, uh, the stimulating discussions that followed. Uh, thank you, presenters, uh, Lynette Meriti, Justin Eckert, Patrick Mabusa, Patrick Mabusa, Armo. Sabri Ben Mafta, Richard Shear, and uh, Deba Suyantio. Uh, let's give our distinguished panel of presenters a big round of applause. A big thank you uh, for colleagues in the interpretation, IT services, and uh, our own evaluation week team. Uh, thank you for your active participation, for making this operations clinic a memorable learning experience. Thank you and bon appetit, ciao. Thanks.